If you fill up that barrel, at some point it overflows. That's when you usually get the more severe symptoms. Our goal is to try to unload, to detoxify that barrel, get rid of the toxins that are in that barrel. But if you continue to add on, there's right. no way you're going to be able to get that barrel empty. Hi, I'm Haley Pomeroy. I'm the Assistant Director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. And today we are all about spreading hope and help for fatigue and chronic illness. I have an incredible guest today, someone that I feel very privileged to get to work with. And I know all of you are going to be better off for spending this time with us together today. Today I have Dr. Irma Ray. Dr. Ray is an assistant professor at the College of Osteopathic Medicine at NSU. Dr. Ray is a board-certified physician in internal medicine and in viral medicine. She primarily treats patients with immune deficiencies, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, ME-CFS. Dr. Ray also specializes in mold and environmental toxins, genetic medicine, and the microbiome. Dr. Ray, thank you so much for being here with me today. You're welcome. I really My pleasure. Appreciate, I really appreciate it. And I know that everybody out there has been wanting to hear from you on a lot of different topics. So today, if we can jump in and start to talk a little bit about your role at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. I know you work with a lot of uh, medical students. I know you see a lot of patients. Can you kind of tell me what your role here is and, and what it feels like to be here at the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine? Well, I'm very honored to be part of the Institute of Immune, Neuroimmune Medicine. Uh, I uh, have been working with Dr. Nancy Klimas since 2010, and um, uh, we um, started the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine in uh, 2012, when we came to Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, and since then, it's evolved into a very large uh, group of, of physicians, clinicians, and researchers. And uh, my role here is I see patients, I try to diagnose patients and help them with their um, symptom management and with their detox uh, program if uh, necessary. And I also try to um, teach medical students. I have, I am also very privileged to train first, second, third, and fourth year medical students. So each one has a unique uh, role in our team. Uh, the first and second year students are here through an elective rotation, and they pick to uh, be here to to have an idea of what internal medicine is like. Because patients with MECFS have a lot of diagnoses that would be appropriate for an internal medicine physician to uh, be involved in uh, diagnosing and treating. And uh, they also come in the third year as an outpatient rotation. Uh, because they're required to do a, a certain number of semesters of internal medicine. And so they also come here for that. Now, during their fourth year, um, they also uh, choose to come to the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine. And I normally have one or two fourth year students, uh, as well as six, uh, six to seven uh, first and second year students. Um, and they in the fourth year, they come because they're looking at different specialties and right. they're interested in specialties that may have something to do with neurology or and, even neuro neuropsychiatry or psychiatry and or internal medicine or family medicine. So they're usually those students that are interested in, in being clinicians. And uh, we have them anywhere from once a week rotations to daily rotations uh, for one month up to two or three months. So we have all all uh, levels and all types of different involvements with students, which is great because it, it we is get great. 
Yeah, yeah we, no, it's it's great. And also, I think to have them exposed to the complexity of chronic disease is is really important as we're thinking about that they're the future of medicine. And and I'll just say watching them kind of flock to your office and and enjoy spending that time with you, it's always exciting to see their excitement. And and Dr. Ray, in part of your journey, and I know you said Dr. Klimas and yourself worked together, was that at University of Miami at the yes, time? Yes, I was with her at the University of Miami from 2010 through 2012, and then we came here to NSU. Nice. And and a, a question that I was thinking about is, in your vast experience in complex disease, whether it's ME, uh, CFS, or maybe Gulf War injury, or an individual that's that's had, I'm going to say, um, multiple diagnostics, why, what is it that has inspired you or motivated you to look at a variety of medicine approaches? And And for me, I want to ask you specifically about environmental medicine? Well, when we started and when when I started, because Dr. Klimas had been, uh, you know, the um, one of the world's leading experts in uh, CFS uh, when I joined her. But when I started in 2010, we were taking an immunologic and virologic approach to the Uh illness because we know that there's viral reactivation in this illness. And there was a um, we were trying to treat their immune system to make their immune system healthier with antioxidants, with immune stimulators, with um, low dose naltrexone. Uh, and we were also trying to quiet the viral activity with herpes antivirals and or with um, things like equilibrant for the uh, Coxsackie virus. Uh, so we had a different approach. I wasn't uh, seeing um, a, you know, I I came from a from from a background of HIV medicine, where yes, by yes. the time that I joined Dr. Klimas, we had antiretrovirals, so we had you know successful treatments. There isn't one successful treatment, you know, one thing that you can give every patient in this patient right. population. Therefore, uh, we were. Uh, asked, uh, I believe the story is, uh, if I remember correctly, because I was there, I should remember it. Uh, <laughs> but Dr. Dr. Klimas was asked to set up a program for the VA hospital uh, in environmental medicine. So she contacted the Academy, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and off we went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, to our first environmental medicine uh, academy meeting. And the first conference was on mold illness. And I saw my patients in in my mouth just fell open because I saw my patients in oh, that I conference. Oh, I just got chills. Yeah. Yep. I just that that's just it. that's the chills that I got. And I started calling back home here and and telling people, you know, that that's what I had seen. Uh I actually have a friend who has M E C F S and I called her and I said, I know what you have now. Oh, uh, so uh, so then I came back and started, you know, researching more and more and attending more conferences, became involved in the board of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and then became president elect and then became president of the academy. So it was a very steep learning curve. But uh, thank God I was able to or thank the universe. I don't want to offend anybody. Absolutely. Um, the. Um, you know, I was able to to um, you know get more and more interested and saw more and more environmental um, effects. I started recognizing the environmental effects. The environmental effects and the mold, the other uh, the mold and other environmental effects were were there. I just wasn't trained to recognize them, and I, I started I wanna, being trained. I want to just unpack that for just a second. I want to take a couple steps back because we are so. Um, ready, right, to embrace our patients and believe our research um, individuals. And so I always say one of the biggest things that we want to share is is that we we believe you, right? We believe what you're going through. But you went through a couple things. You talked about viral reactivation and immune system and then environmental medicine piece. Um, 
uh, so many people out there that, you know, and I am in involved and in read and advocacy for individuals with chronic disease, especially um, ME-CFS, they're told that it's in their mind, that there's nothing wrong. And so I want to just touch a little bit on kind of those three components. And then I want to go a little bit deeper into environmental medicine. So first we're finding that there is an inflammatory aspect or an immune aspect, correct? With people that are, that are dealing with this? Correct. Okay. So it's not, it's not just, they don't feel great or they need to exercise more or eat a different diet. There's something actually going on in the immune system. Right. Well, eating, eating great is, yes. is good. Exercising a little bit and very gradually with very definitive guidance is good, but there is something that broke the immune system. And that's where oh, I, I think that. the environment comes in I because I think, I think that the environment, uh, damaged, I think that our patients may have had genetic predispositions, which may be genetic inherited or epigenetic which actually occurred in their own lifetime because a lot of these chemicals will damage your genetics so therefore i we have to look for all these possibilities i feel like before i wasn't looking at enough possibilities and that environmental medicine has given me tools to look at more possibilities of things that could have damaged my patient's health and therefore i can have a better shot at helping them uh, and being their partner in, in being restored to health. It, I, I just got chills again. Every time something that I know that someone out there needs to hear, it's just, it's just moving to me because I struggled for so, so long. Can, can you explain to us, I would say pencils and crayons, what is environmental? Environ, I can't even say it. What is environmental medicine? What does that encompass? So environmental medicine is the study of how, you know, our our environment, our our air, our water, our food, our, you know, house, our work environment, everything, how that affects your health and the many things that that can go wrong that can impact your health. So when they talk about maybe like causative agents, I know sometimes we look at molds, like in California, the black mold. I mean, everybody was, and in Texas, a lot of people were were talking about that. Is that one component component of everything? Is, is there is there plastics and pollutants and what what are some causative agents in environmental medicine that we look for in our patient population? So, I look for mold definitely because the black mold's not just limited to Texas and California. It's all <laughs> over the United States. As a matter of fact, I used to think that it was only in Florida. Um, oh, wow. I know that some of the early patients that uh, have been impacted by MECFS uh, from Incline Village and from that area of uh, Nevada, California, uh, have suspected that black mold was a component of their uh, of their Epstein-Barr activation. And I agree with them. I believe that the Epstein-Barr became activated because the immune system could no longer handle the Epstein-Barr because it was damaged by the by the black mold toxins. So let, um, me unpack, let me unpack that for a second because I'm just kind of blown away. So Epstein-Barr virus, virus, EBV, comes from when we maybe were exposed to mono at, at some point in our life. Is that correct? We could have been exposed in utero. It's Ooh. one of the the herpes viruses are one of the things that gynecologists check for that are placentally transmitted. So we uh. could have been exposed uh, from, you know, our ancestors having been exposed to it. Oh, that's um, fascinating. I, I was I got mono when I was nursing my daughter. And it's interesting because she has dealt a lot with viral reactivation. And I, I've wondered oftentimes, um, you know, what her what her I, I, get, I get my time with Dr. Ray, I'm going to talk all about me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Dr. Ray, when when the immune system is kind of holding those viruses, I'm going to say in check, the exposure will offset the immune system or how does that work? They get, they get exposure and the immune system goes high, low, crazy. What, what happens? So for example, the, you know, I'm going to use some big words, uh, in with, with mold toxins, they cause 
translocation of proteins. So they cause proteins not to be, they, they're made, they may be made correctly, but they may not go to the right, right place. So therefore, uh, enzymes don't function in the body. And if enzymes don't function in the body, the immune system may not function in the body. They can cause, you know, alterations in the cytokines, which are the messengers of the immune system is what, what I like to call them uh, in, in simple terms. And they can, the altered cytokines can cause, you know, natural killer cell uh, dysfunction. So therefore, there's a lot of effect that the the mold toxins can can cause. And I actually, thanks to our patients, uh, was able to publish, you know, and our medical students, because they were of an integral part, I was able to publish an article on the prevalence of of aspergillus mold, which is another mold that's very prevalent uh, and makes a lot of toxins that are very damaging to the immune system, like okra toxin. So, um, so they, when they have an exposure to that, then their immune system is no longer functioning correctly. So, therefore, the viruses can go haywire because those that immune system is supposed to keep, you know, whenever you're exposed to one of those uh, long-term viruses like Epstein-Barr, like HHV6, which is roseola, like Coxsackie, which is hand, foot, and mouth disease, like cytomegalovirus. Yeah, that's uh, me. <laughs> or like Parvo B19 virus, yeah. which is just fifth disease. Um, you know, we say just fifth, just roseola, because roseola is measles-like uh, in its appearance, and it happens in children. And these are all childhood illnesses. However, they're supposed to be kept in check for the rest of your life. Once you have the episode, you're not supposed to have chronic reactivation of it. Right. But in our patients, they unfortunately have chronic reactivations. And even sometimes by giving high dose antivirals, we still can't get those reactivations in check. And even if we do get the, the numbers to look well on paper, they still don't feel well. So that's why I'm glad that we have other tools in environmental medicine. And you mentioned, you know, plastics, pesticides, petroleum, styrofoam, um, Roundup, all those, uh, you know, um, glyphosate, I should call it instead of Roundup, because there's uh, probably other brands out there in the world. Uh, but there's all kinds of, of um, toxins that can impact your immune system. And you can actually check online to see what toxins are in your tap water because uh there's a group of of scientists i don't know if i'm allowed to mention but yeah, the environmental absolutely. working group the ewg the environmental working group has a website online that you can just google or or look any any search engine and look up the environmental working group and look up your tap water put in your zip code and you know what toxins are in your water Wow. That's and, yeah. And it's, and it's, I, I, we've done a lot of research kind of in the different areas that I live. I have a well in, in one area, but then, um, and I haven't tested all the time, but then I didn't think, I mean, I don't know why I wasn't thinking about, I live, have a home in Southern California also. And I, you gave me that website on one of our clinical meetings and I looked it up and I, I was, I was kind of in shock. I apologized to my dogs for using tap water for their bowls. And I just, I was in showering and, and was just kind of in shock about that. The, the average person that's out there and maybe they're dealing with, or they have a, all of us, you know, have a friend, a loved one that are dealing with autoimmunity, um, chronic inflammation, um, ME, uh, CFS. How would a person feel if they had environmental toxins creating an, a disharmony in the body? What types of symptoms do you see when patients walk in? Fatigue, post-exertional fatigue or malaise, you know, just feeling fluish after doing any minimal um, mental or physical activity because we have many patients that come in and they can do all the physical activity in the world. But once things get stressful at work or at home, that's when they start crashing. So it's not just a uh, physical um, activity. Uh, they can also have muscle pain, joint pain, unrefreshing sleep or all types of sleep disorders. So they go to bed and they wake up and they're just as tired as they woke up. They wake up just as tired as they went to bed if not more tired, because they don't get 
refreshing sleep. A lot of times they have problems with REM sleep or deep sleep. And we look for those things also. I send patients a lot to a uh, sleep specialist to have their sleep evaluated because I can't make somebody better if their sleep is is poor. It's that's, impossible. That's, so I, I, I want to re I want to punctuate and reiterate that um, when patients come in or when we're looking at things with patients, and it's interesting because Dr. Klimas was was talking about that as well. That it, that that if we don't address that and focus on that. And is, is that because sleep is where we do all of our restoration? Is that because we detoxify more efficiently during sleep? Why is, why I, I'm a short and powerful sleeper. I always say, I mean, I'm fast and furious. I go deep, I go short and then I'm, you know, wake up like a firecracker. Is, is there an efficiency that happens in the body where the body can release toxins, where the immune system gets reset? What happens and why is that so important? All of the above. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, you detox during sleep and and you fix memory during sleep. So if you're not getting uh, REM sleep, if you're not getting deep sleep, you're not fix fixing your memory. So your memory is is you know whatever you did, you may not remember it. So a lot of times they have problems with short term memory because they can't you know they can't get the memory to stick uh, where it has to um, stick to to be able to be retained, and uh, they can't detox chemicals out of their brain so that they have constant neuroinflammation. Uh, so which came first, the chicken or the egg, the neuroinflammation or the poor sleep or both? And I always say, let's the, the, the healing, whatever came first, what needs to come second is the healing, right? Correct. Is the, is, the, is getting on that journey. Correct. And, and that's what has been inspiring for me. Um, if a if an individual's out there and they're listening and they want to have kind of some of this conversation with their practitioner, um, I know you've been very um, involved as as the president of, of organizations. How can they get some more data about environmental medicine so they can feel like they walk into their visit, maybe having a conversation? How how would one get tested? Do they should they go to an environmental specialist, environmental medicine specialist, or do they have this discussion with their doc? Like, how does that work? I mean, I know well, it, it works. It in depends our office, what but... the access is exactly, okay. because there aren't that many uh, environmental medicine specialists. But if they want to get an environmental medicine specialist, they can look at the American Academy of Environmental Medicine website because they have um, practitioners listed in just about every state. Wonderful! And, I, and I love that resource. The numbers are growing, thankfully. Um, and the uh, other thing is that you know, thankfully at least national public radio, because when I was driving into work today, they were talking about how the, the state of New York is having a discussion with PepsiCo because I think I heard 20% of the plastic waste that's being found in the, in the uh, waterways in New York state uh, come from PepsiCo. And I'm not trying to be selective that's just what was what i i'm Reporting. repeating what i think i remember from public radio so thankfully you know the the uh media is getting more and more uh savvy about you know the, the climate change and the toxic effects of of single use plastics and the toxic effects of waste from industry and the toxic effect of of uh just you know even our household products our food Everything can have okay. contaminants on it. Absolutely. I, I always say, you know, w if you eat, breathe, drink, or sleep, you're plan on being poisoned, right? Every day, all day. And so optimizing your body's capacity to detoxify and eliminate or bind those toxins are are going to help you not get knocked off balance for, for lack of a better way to kind of describe it. Um and and it is interesting, and I love what you just said about the art. I was I listened to that as well. Um, we talk about being in Colorado. We had a lot of mercury in our fish because of um, mining, right? During during the time, and we couldn't we could only you know catch and release not just to increase the population, but, but there was like there's no way you should eat those fish. <laughs> um, and so you know so we consume things that have have toxins and exposures. Um, it, for those individuals that are out there that are looking for some pearls of wisdom. Are there some tips that you can say that can one reduce exposure, but two help the body mobilize or um, deal with exposure more efficiently? 
So again, I'm going to defer to the Environmental Working Group because they have that information on their website and it. it's accessible to everyone. So they have, you know, the dirty dozen yes. uh, uh, fruits and vegetables listed there. So those, you know, sometimes stores will have them organic. Uh, on sale, or sometimes you can just buy them frozen and it organic frozen, and they'll be less expensive than organic fresh. But you're still going to get a better product than if you buy non-organic or genetically modified. Um, so try that. Try to look at your water as as we talked that before. You brought up, you know, the the heavy metals, which I had not mentioned, and heavy metals is another uh, factor that uh, tends to damage our patient population and tends to to uh, make their immune system not work properly. So also electromagnetic forces. So all this exposure that we have to, you know, unfortunately podcasts, but, you yes. know, <laughs> spending too much time online, uh, you you need to be protected from that. And, and especially around bedtime, you should not be exposed to anything electronic within two hours at least of bedtime because it, it will disrupt your sleep. It'll disrupt your brain waves, therefore disrupt your sleep. And so, the blue so, light is very damaging. So Dr. Ray, is it safe to say your immune system needs you to unplug? Your immune system needs you to unplug. Okay. That's a good that's a good okay. way of putting it. Yeah. I I I for me, I know kind of on a conscious level, maybe subconscious a little bit, but that I should do that. But having an autoimmune disorder, the way you just said it to me, I, I it's like a no-brainer now. I'm like, okay, I can do that because there's so many things you can't control. I also love that you brought up water. I think a lot of times people don't aren't conscious enough about the water that they're drinking. But, it, you know, the, whatever you want to say, dilution is the solution for pollution or our bodies, you know, 80 or whatever percentage water. I, I, I get that concept. But is there is there are there filters that can help with tap waters or, you know, do we because then we're in the do we buy bottled waters with plastic? Do we I, you know, how how do we are there two or th tips that you can give me going forward that I can at least help my water source? So I I prefer filtered water to, to plastic water. I yep. call it plastic water because plastic water usually travels in unrefrigerated trucks. So therefore, the plastic is leaching into the water. Okay. Uh, therefore, plastic water is a no-no unless you have no other water that you can access and you need it for your bodily functions. But... Uh, so e either water in glass, so you can buy water in glass, but it's very expensive, but yes. you can get reverse osmosis water is the optimal water. The only thing is you need to remember to replace electrolytes uh, when you take reverse osmosis, when you drink reverse osmosis water, because it, it won't have electrolytes in it. And then uh, the uh, second choice is, you know, they have over the, on, on top of the counter, filters that you can use. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the refrigerator filters are not very good. They're a single okay. carbon filter and they get, they tend, even though the light may stay green, they tend to get uh, full of chemicals pretty quickly. So I don't, I don't recommend that, but if that's all you have access to, that's better than nothing. If you have access to that and then a, a pitcher filtration, maybe you can run the water from the refrigerator through another filtration system and, and get it filtered that way. But optimal is to go to reverse osmosis. And you can find systems again online that um, right. you can you can find which things are removed. Uh, and you can look at what's in your area because in your area, right. you may be able to get away with, you know, just using a, a charcoal filtration. They also have now ceramic filters because I was looking it up with a patient yesterday. Uh, because unfortunately, some of our patients have sensitivities to carbon yeah. uh, because they're allergic to coconut. So therefore, they do have also ceramic filtration systems that people can use. So there are alternatives out there. It takes a little bit of work, but initially, uh, you know, it's like a startup cost of time and energy, but it's worth it in the long run because Absolutely. you have a much better outcome. And Dr. Ray, I would love, if you're willing, I'd love to have you on another podcast where we go deep into maybe 
each of the four pockets. Maybe we hit molds, maybe we hit metals, um, maybe we hit plastics and, and something that I'm probably, <laughs> that I'm probably, maybe endotoxins or toxins that our body secretes within ourselves or, or something. I, I'd love to go really deep into that. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to beg you for that. I, I want to, my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I want to just, um, for a minute, talk about Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. And, you know, one of my favorite times is when we all get together on Fridays. I, I joyfully um, have taken that meeting in, in every airport I, you could imagine because I don't like to miss it even on my days off. But we talk a lot about different cases and collaborate about a lot of different cases. Um, and the biggest thing that hits me is just kind of the dedication that you guys have to your patients. Being someone that struggled for years to find hope and help. Um, for an autoimmune disorder and, you know, should have been turned back in the lemon law many years ago. Um, what do you think is, is at the forefront? Like, where do you see the most exciting aspects of this type of medicine 10 years from now? Like dream big, what's your dream for this? I think we'll be able to predict genetically who's going to react badly to different things. I think we're going to, especially to medications, because medications can also be very harmful uh, yes. and and uh, antibiotics can be very harmful for our microbiome. We didn't delve into the microbiome portion of it, but uh, there's, there's many things that can damage our microbiome. And I think we have more and more tools to look at that. And that's going to be uh, the future of of medicine that genetic medicine is going to be part of personalized medicine and as we do more and more personalized medicine which is what i'm trying to teach uh the medical students uh we will be able to avoid a lot of side effects we'll be able to spe to get more specific doses i'm o i always marvel at how you know a lot of times medications are released at one dose and then 10 years later we have a dose that's one fourth of that dose. Yes, and that means that some portion of yeah. the population was being, you know, overtreated, and uh, so therefore we always go low and and go slow in our medication titrations and in our treatments. And uh, I think that that's that's what it is. It's we're going to have more personalized medicine, and the, um, the all the computer tools will be able to help us hopefully to have a better outcome. So just what's like, with, I ahead. love that you said that. No. And what's exciting for me is that it's nice to think about the future of medicine and, and having hope around that. But what we get to witness is you're teaching all of these up and coming doctors. And so you're able to show them the power of customization of medicine and incorporating every tool that you could possibly think of. And, and for me as the lay person, I think putting the patient back into the equation, when you use the word customized, it just puts the patient front and center in the whole medicine relationship. And I, and that's, it's, um, that's very moving for me. And, and maybe again, because of the medical struggles, it, people that are out there that are listening right now that are going to go and engage with their practitioner can you give them one or two or three tips of how they can prepare for a visit so they could get the most potential for customized medicine? W what types of things do you appreciate when a patient comes through the door, either in preparation or, or experience or openness um, that you feel like gets them from where they're at to on the health journey in the most rapid way possible? So if I... Um... I'm able to receive from the patient a, a list of medications, including all their over-the-counter medications that they're taking, and also include any medications in the past that, that may not have given them an allergic reaction, but may have given them a bad reaction. Right. That they may, you know, they may not have developed a rash or shortness of breath or swelling, but that they didn't have a good response to. Uh, I want to know about those because if I have them in the list, it's much easier. You know, the, the more things I get, I get in terms of a list, if I get a dateline of when the symptoms started, but if there was something weird going on in between, and you know, before that, because that's something that a lot of times I have to look for is, you know, yes, maybe the symptoms start in 2016, but 
since childhood, I was already having like asthma or I was already, you know, having frequent strep infections or I was already having whatever. So if you can give me a, a line, you know, a date line from when you were born, anything significant that happened from wh when you were born, if your parents were getting divorced, you know, in the right. time that you were being born, right. that's all going to have an meaningful effect on medicine. you. So that's all a very meaningful part of, of family history, social history, you right. know, uh, past medical history, past surgical history, all that is very important, include allergies, you know, any toxins that you may know you were exposed to, any moving around if you were, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, our armed forces, uh, yes. quote unquote, brat, yes. and had to go to many different places. Let me know all that. Letting any physician know all that I think is is really important, and and I think that the physicians that really care to know you uh, a lot, that then try to try to know everything about you, will want that information. That's great. Um, so to so to articulate, be able to tell your story, to articulate your story, and that's that's the way to engage in meaning in meaningful medicine. Correct, um, Doctor Ray. I can't thank you enough. It's just always so inspiring. I I envy your patients. I envy your students. They're so fortunate to get to spend the time that they get to. And and what I want to do is just let everybody know out there that, um, you know, we're working tire tirelessly. I never say that word to find solutions through research um, in the clinic and that we believe you. Right. And um, to keep searching, you know, one of our one of our physicians said it can take 10 years and 10 doctors to get help. That's kind of the average <laughs> for a lot of people that are dealing with complex disease. Um, I, I always love to part with this, um, Dr. Ray, in a person's uh, world, you mentioned organic foods and, and, you know, not having those chemical exposures. Is their lifestyle as far as nutrition and sleep, um, obviously water intake, is that going to be a significant help in getting them is getting them well. Is that something that you address? Yes, because, you know, in, in environmental medicine, we talk about total body toxic load. So mm. I can be, that's the, the key word. And Dr. William Rea, who was one of the founders of environmental medicine, always had uh, a, a little uh, barrel that he used uh, to show the different contaminants, how they could add up and what effect they could have. And if you fill up that barrel, at some point it overflows. That's when you usually get the more severe symptoms. We can, we are, our our goal is to try to unload, you know, to to detoxify that barrel, get rid of the toxins that are in that barrel. But if you continue to add on, there's right. no way you're going to be able to to uh, get that barrel empty. And unless that barrel is empty or almost empty, it you're not going to feel better you may feel a little bit better but you don't you won't feel as well as you sh as you can you know you won't you won't uh, be able to achieve your your maximum potential unless you try to not add anything else so also air purification is very important so i love that you know uh, having air purifiers if if whatever people can afford they don't have to have whole house purification just wherever they spend the most amount of time and Funny thing that you mentioned about the little grand rounds that we have on Friday mornings. I was in Spain in September and I dialed in, uh, well, I, I zoomed didn't... in from Spain and got shushed in the in the hotel, even though it was three o'clock in the afternoon over there. Uh, but we, uh, you I know, I, I missed Barcelona. it. from Barcelona. I, yeah. I zoomed. I, that's so funny. Me, I don't want to miss it. Yeah, Me yeah. too. I, that's exactly, I, I, I zoomed in from Barcelona also, where I was giving a lecture to the patients over there. So, uh, so yes, we, the collaboration we have in this team is fantastic. And, uh, and I'm very honored to be here. And, and when you said about the patients and the, and the students being uh, lucky to have me, I'm lucky to have them. There's nothing else I can think of to do what you know with my life this is my life's dream um so i i'm very glad to be able to do this uh taking care of patients and teaching is what i love to do the most well we are all so fortunate we're we're all the on the receiving end of your dream so 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 keep it up we can, we, we love it we love it dr dr ray i look forward to our next podcast there's so many topics that i wanted to jump into 
Um, I cannot thank you enough. I look forward to seeing you on Friday and uh, we will, we will speak again soon. And thank you again. Everybody is, is just going to be so grateful for this wisdom today. Thank Thank you. you. It's my, uh, it's my pleasure. 